are using Zoom right now, um, and we would love for you all to uh, be able to participate with us, and that can be done through raising your hand, using the chat a function, as well as reactions. That's always helpful for us to understand how things are landing with all of you, but also to, for all of you to hear from one another. So this is your official Tiger Team facilitators. Um, we've got uh, myself, Eureka Del Cruz, Program Manager, Social Drivers of Health, and I'm joined by Nalani Tarant, um, our Deputy Director of Social Drivers of Health. And then we've got Chloe. Um, she's also joined us today, but I know she's having some tech issues, so she's going to be listening today. Um, but she's your main point of contact with all things related to the Tiger Team. Um, so just wanted to highlight your team for today. And then always we want to acknowledge, um, you know, that this is a our all of our efforts related to prepare um, is, you know, it was originally done in collaboration with between NAC, APSHO, and OPCA. And just to level set that today's presentation is being facilitated by NAC. So I would love to hear from all of you right now and get a sense of who's in the room. So please drop in the chat when you have a moment. Um, your name, your title, and your organization. We'd love to get a sense of who's in the virtual room. Um, some of us, uh, it's always nice to see who's, what colleagues are joining us and from where. It's always nice to get a sense of where everyone's from. So when you have a moment, please drop that in the chat. Um, and then I'm actually going to launch a poll for today. And this one is, we'd love to hear from you all in terms of does your health center have an SDOH data strategy? So you should all be seeing the poll right now. Um, and we'd love to get an idea of who, how many of you have a strategy in place. And so far we've got a good percentage of you all participating. This is wonderful. I will be sharing the results or the responses shortly. Um, we're at about 60% of folks that have completed the poll, but we'd love to hear some more. Um, so definitely don't be shy. <laughs> there is no right or wrong answer. It's just reality. Um, so we'd definitely love to hear from you all. So we're almost at 70%. So once we get to about 80%, I'll go ahead and close the poll, but we're almost there. So uh, give you all a couple more seconds to answer. I've seen some responses in the chats. That's wonderful. Glad to see that you all are introducing yourselves. Thank you for joining us. And we're at 70% in terms of folks that have um, completed the poll. So if we can just get a couple more folks to get us to 80%, that would be wonderful. I'd love to just have some great data, obviously, just to get a sense of um, all of you that are able to um, give us an idea of how things are going at your health center. All right, so give, give you all a couple more seconds. If you haven't responded yet, all right, awesome. We are at 81%. So thank you for all of you, to all of you for responding. Um, so I'll go ahead and end the poll right now so I can share the results. So here we have, um, here are the responses. So does your health center have an SUH data strategy? Um, so we have about 14% of you said that yes, and it works well for you all. Around 46% of you stated that yes, you do have one, but you're looking to make improvements. 26% of you said that no, and we're, we're new to collecting SDOH data. So thank you for sharing that. Um, about 3% of you are not collecting social needs data, and that's totally fine. We, we're definitely welcoming of everyone. And then about 11% of you are not sure. Um, so thank you all for taking a moment to complete the poll. I think this helps us understand, both Nalani and I understand of um, where everyone is at in terms of collecting this data, but also where they're at in terms of doing the analysis with this. So we're, we're glad that you all joined us today. This is, um, today's session will be hopefully uh, provide all of you with some rich data and information, but also conversation amongst each other. So I'll go ahead and stop us um, sharing the results. All right, so for today's learning objectives, um, we have explored considerations for building an effective prepa prepared data strategy, and then understand the steps for prepared data analysis to make evidence-based decisions and better manage patient health. Um, do, do wanna kind of reflect a little bit on the responses that we heard earlier in terms of 
folks that are doing the data analysis, people that are not sure, and that's okay. I think that's something that we've seen in our time uh, working uh, with health centers and prepare users is that everyone is on a different point of their journey, but also there's different people that are involved in doing data collection and analysis of prepare, right? So it's okay if you don't know what's going on, um, that's totally fine. It's something that uh, we know that everyone is at different places. So I just wanna just normalize that so no one feels like they're not doing something and they should be shamed for that. We know this takes a lot of time and effort and resources in order to do it very effectively. So, so now as we're gonna jump into today's session, kind of wanna level set a little bit in terms of, um, you know, why it's important to build a strategy, right? And so, as you can see here, um, when it comes to data analysis, you are all doing the very critical work of actually collecting the data, right? You're collecting, you're doing the screening with your patients, you're, you're documenting in the EHR or on paper or whatever method you're using. But now it comes to a point where we need to think about what do we do with that information and how can we leverage it, right? And so when it comes to thinking about a data strategy, there are several things that we have to think about as, as we consider one. Um, and, and when it comes to developing a strong data strategy, it's really a roadmap that allow us to define several questions. And it'll really allow us to all be on the same page in terms of understanding what will be done with the data. And I know that's often a question that comes up for staff that are collecting or that are doing the prepare screening, but also for patients and partners, right? What's gonna be done with this data? We wanna know that it's not just gonna live locked under lock and key and no one's gonna use it later on. So we wanna know what's gonna be done with that data, right? Then we wanna understand how the data will achieve organizational goals, right? How is this, how is this data allowing your health center or your organization to advanced health equity to really understand the needs of your community and your patient population. The next question that we have here is, who will have access to the data, right? So once we've collected this, this information, what is done with the data, but then who has access to it, right? And that really is, is something that needs to be done in parallel. Um, and then how will the content be shared, right? So how will the content, how will the data and the findings and the information that we've learned from this, uh, from prepare screenings, how will it be shared and who will get this information? So will it be clinical teams? Will it be organizational teams? Will it be partners or maybe even funding opportunities or fund our, our, our grants that we work with, right? The, our funders. So those are just some other considerations when thinking about um, how the content will be shared. And then really drilling down to how we'll prepare activities um, how can they support our data collection and our data strategy, right? So really understanding how we fine tune our strategies at the health center, at our, at our organization, so that we understand what are the best activities that can support our data analysis. So when it comes to really outlining data goals, um, obviously we have to start from the top and really think about um, who are the key leadership um, key leaders and key staff members that really need to be part of this discussion so that we can understand and identify organizational objectives for prepared data collection. So with, within these considerations, we're thinking about what are your specific objectives with data collection, right? More than just assess and just uh, being able to understand the needs of our patients, maybe it's a provider referral, but are we doing something more beyond that? We also want to understand who is the target audience or the population of your data collection strategy, right? Is it for grants? Is it for HRSA? We know UDS is coming, UDS Plus is coming down the pike, right? So who is the target audience for this data collection and this data strategy? And then what is the baseline? How do we understand that where what our current state is and how we'll be moving forward with our strategy, right? And so with all of this, uh, these are very important questions to reflect on as a team. Again, uh, key leaders and key staff need to be part of these conversations. And when, when I mentioned staff, really it's about our clinical teams, our, our, our enabling services or community health workers that are primarily doing the prepare screenings, correct? And then also our data infrastructure team, like our quality improvement teams, they have to be at the table as well. So one of the things to really think about is what is the goal that you wanna achieve and then work backwards, right? And this is just one of the key considerations to think about as you think about um, how do we 
get to the destination that we're going to. Um, and that's how we'll figure out our roadmap. Um, one of the, the great examples that my mom used to always say was, we know we want to go to uh, Elizabeth, New Jersey, but there's several routes to get there. Um, so which, what direction, what route are we taking to get to our final destination, right? We also want to make sure that it's a participatory process so that everyone that's involved in this in this um, in this process is part of the discussion, right? And part of it is really reflects of nothing for us without us. So always as much as possible include the staff, as I mentioned earlier, that are directly part of this process, but also patients, see what their what their insights are as well. And you also want to make sure that the goals are very specific and measurable so that you're able to really track your progress and really document that wonderful work that you're doing here. So these are just some examples of prepared data goals. So the first one is use data to improve at least one key barrier for the general adult population at the community level. So maybe um, that is a uh, barrier that maybe it's a language access barrier, right? Or maybe it's something around transportation. So that's an example. And then drilling down even further into this, this example, um, another example could be increased referrals for food assistance by at least 25% above the baseline for six months. So in this particular example, you know that maybe out of um, all of your patients that you're screening, that you're doing the prepared screenings on, you have about, um, let's say, just theoretically, 30% are screening positive uh, for food insecurity, right? Um, out of those 30%, how many of them are actually getting referrals for to address their, their food insecurity, to give them food, right? Um, from there, you would then figure out, okay, what's a, what's a good number, a reasonable number that we, can, that we can increase our referral goals by, right? So if let's say out of that 30%, maybe, um, half of your patients are getting a referral, maybe bump it up to 60 or 70%. So this way it maintains, it's something that's reasonable and achievable as well. So those are some examples, not to say that that's what you should be doing, but just wanted to provide an example for all of you. Now here, when we talk about assessing prepared data capacity and infrastructure, probably this should look familiar, um, but these are the three buckets that we're always talking about when it comes to prepare. Um, we always want to think about the people that will be involved in this, and particularly with data, with data capacity and infrastructure, we really want to make sure that we involve our IT data staff. Um, they're really critical to this work. Um, our leadership members, and as well as other staff um, that are part of this effort, as I previously mentioned. And whenever you can, leverage any existing partners or collaborations. Maybe your PCA is, is a great partner in this. They, they could probably provide some great insights for all of you, but maybe some external partners as well may be able to provide some, some insights. Then you also wanna look at the processes, right? This is where you wanna understand what's currently happening and then figure out what are some ways that we can, excuse me, possibly improve the process, but also understand Maybe we can tighten this up a little bit more. Maybe I've also seen this uh, plenty of times where sometimes people are doing, they're, they're achieving the work, but they each have a different process for doing it. So maybe um, getting on the same page and agreeing on a, a, a similar, the same process of that, we're all doing the same work. And this way we're, we're addressing any sort of concerns, but also really understanding, you know, what's the most efficient way of doing the work. And then finally, technology. And this is where we think about how do we, what tools do we have? What capacity um, does our EHR have in terms of data aggregation, reporting, analysis tools? We know a lot of you also use Azara. That's a great tool as well. Um, but, you also, but you definitely want to look at what's already available within your technology so that you're able to leverage that um, and maybe fine tune that as much as possible. All right, so as we continue moving on forward, this is a wonderful resource, um, the Center for Care Innovations Data Analytics Capability Assessment. Um, this is a great starting point for all of us in terms of really understanding, um, you know, what are, where are we at in terms of our capacity, right? And this, this assessment has examples of assessing data analytics capacity in the three key areas that I just mentioned, people, processes, and technology. Um, this is just a snippet of their assessment, so I definitely recommend you all take a look at that. Um, what you see within this, right, is that there's different levels. And what's nice about this is, again, you get to gauge where your current capacity is at, and then you know where to where you want to move forward on. 
Um, so this one, this this one in particular, this screenshot is specifically looking at people. And we see here senior leadership sponsorship and then data stewardship. And so as you see the different levels from left to right, um, you can see that um, the different categories are reactive, which is, means that we're kind of responding as the need arises or as the questions arise. And so this is kind of the state where we're in. Where we're responsive is that um, we're resolving problems and we're really able to really move a little bit further along in the continuum, but we're still there's still some fine tuning needed, right? Um, so maybe we're able to start doing some of this work, but it's still not really fleshed out. When we get proactive, that's where we realize in this particular level is that we're starting to anticipate our, start, our structures and our systems anticipate this need, right? And so we're able to have processes in place. Things are clearly defined, roles are clearly defined. And so we're, again, we're in this place where we're really building that infrastructure, right? And then the predictive level is where things automatically happen and where we're starting to get to a place where we're flowing and going as you will. So I'm not gonna go into too much detail with this, but in you'll see with each particular domain, you'll see the example move from reactive to predictive and you'll be able to get a sense of where you're at. And again, it's okay if you're in reactive or responsive. I mean, that I think that's the reality at a lot of health centers and just really a lot of organizations just because of staffing and turnover. Um, but this is a good way to get a sense of where you're at and then as a team, then you're able to really understand what's the priority, maybe what are some low hanging fruits? Um, what are some opportunities that are a little bit more within reach that you're able to move forward? So again, this particular snippet looks at senior, senior leadership sponsorship, um, which is very critical in terms of identifying um, and mobilizing the resources that you all need to do this data analysis. But then also we have here data stewardship, right? How do we have, how do we formalize these partnerships? How do we have everything outlined so that there's clear definitions and roles for everybody? So the next example here is our processes, right? So again, we're, look, we're using the same columns or the same categories again in terms of reactive, responsive, proactive, and predictive. And again, you'll see here how things progress over time when we think about our data strategy and our data governance. So I'm not gonna go into too much definition here, but this is again, a very great, example to see of where you're at and where you want to move forward to. And it's okay if you just if you're in responsive and that's the most that's what makes the most sense for you all, that is okay. That is perfectly fine. And when you're all ready, you know, there are definitely resources and steps available to help you move from responsive to proactive. So here again, we're seeing the different capability levels within data strategy and data governance. Um, and again, this has to do with process. And then finally, we have here technology. Um, and this is another one. This, this one, I will definitely emphasize that this will be very um, important for you all to really get a sense of where you're at. And this is gonna take a lot of partnership with our EHR vendors, any other IT tools that you all use. This will be very important to have this assessment so you can leverage this information to to have these conversations with different vendors, with your EMR company, so that you're able to move forward as you're most able to. Um, also just wanna kind of uh, clarify a little bit more that when we think about um, the definitions for the capability levels, just wanted to provide a little bit more contact, context in terms of reactive, right? Maybe there's um, no evidence or very little evidence of capability, and that's okay. That's kind of where reactive is at. Responsive is where there's um, there's some evidence, there's some integration, but it's really um, piecemeal. Maybe it's just bits and pieces. It's not very cohesive. When we see things that are proactive, we start seeing that things are becoming more and more integrated, right? So things are starting to work a little bit better together. Um, there's cohesion and things are kind of well-defined and you're able to really, everyone's able to do what's under their purview and they understand it and they're doing it to the best of their ability. And then finally with, with predictive is things are fully integrated, they're aligned organizationally and people are just flowing and going there. They're able to leverage all the tools and resources at their fingertips 
and things are happening and um, it's going to take a little while to get there, but just um, just wanting to provide a little bit more context in terms of each of these different levels. And it's going to be some growing pains. It's going to be, um, it'll, it'll be a little rough to get from, from one level to the next, but it'll be well worth it once you're at predictive and you're able to really get to a place where you're all just moving together um, in a very seamless, integrated, cohesive way. So then here, um, just want to get into some a couple examples in terms of um, how this all looks like in terms of outlining a data roadmap. Um, and so again, these are just some of the key elements for data road mapping. So at the organizational level, what are the specific measures that will be used? Uh, what data sources will they come from? And how will the data be organized and integrate? Um, how will they be organized? And then in what systems will they be integrated in? And then in terms of access and sharing, answering those questions of who will have the access to the data and how will you report and share the data? The validation piece is very important. So how will the da data be validated to ensure that it is accurate and consistent? And that's a whole different process. So we'll, we'll be sure to provide more information on that. And then the analysis plan. So once you've done all of this work, what's the analysis gonna look like? Who, what analyses will you run on it, right? There's, there's different sorts of an analyses that you can run with, with this data. So you have to specify which ones you're gonna focus on first. Um, but then more importantly, you have to really outline which, um, how will these analyses lead to your goals, right? How will they allow you to uh, move closer to accomplishing your organizational goals? And then how will you report data to understand if your goal was met? Also, just with all of this, this, this is a really just a great way to keep your staff engaged and to really help them understand their role in prepared data collection, but also what's done with the data. So then here, uh, when we think about, this is an example from the toolkit. Um, so you see here the, the different um, um, examples of suggested staff roles and their responsibilities for developing a data work plan. So this is just an idea for all of you, just so, so you have an, uh, a sense of who possibly at your health center or organization should be part of this process. Um, this has been very helpful, I would say, for those, um, for the PREPARE pioneers, if you will, that did this work when PREPARE was initially um, established, right? And so here you had the EHR lead, the clinical informatics lead, the data analyst, the QI improvement lead, finance, operations, and compliance. All of these roles are just some examples of who should be at the table when you're developing and implementing your data roadmap. And then here, this is the sample data strategy worksheet. Again, this is from um, the Center for Care Innovations. Um, and we have this, um, this is in the toolkit and I believe we can, we are able to share the link, um, but just wanted to provide this and just give you all an idea of uh, once you've completed the assessment, then this is where you'll be able to think about, okay, how do we make this come to life? How do we really understand what is our plan of action? What is our course of action? What are the resources that are needed? And one thing that um, we can never overemphasize is keep it as small and manageable as possible because we know that time and resources are limited and um, it can be really difficult um, to do a lot of changes at once. So definitely um, pace yourselves with this and just do one thing at a time. Um, but here, this is a great worksheet just to flesh it out and to provide you all with um, a roadmap of what to do um, as you move this forward. So at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and hand things over to Nala. Oh, hello, can you still hear me? Okay, great. Hi everyone. Um, sorry, I'm not on camera today. I'm having some slight tech issues with my camera, but thanks to Eureka. And so I'm gonna pick up from where Eureka left off. So after you've gone through those initial steps, you'll want to conduct a prepared data analysis, which is the process of inspecting, cleaning, transforming, modeling data with the goal of discovering useful information, suggesting conclusions, and supporting decision-making. Within this phase, there are six steps, and I'll briefly walk through each of these steps with an example. Okay, so our first step is understanding what is your analysis question? What do you want to track or to uncover? 
So you may wanna refer back to your roadmap that you created earlier, but more importantly, you wanna develop a question that is measurable and concise. So for example, if we wanna better understand how individuals who have been diagnosed with hypertension have been affected by social risk factors, we could ask how are social risk factors correlated with hypertension at our health center? From there, you'll wanna think about how will you measure this question? You'll want to determine the time frame and measure units. So building off our hypertension question, we can look at patients who have been diagnosed with hypertension the past year and positive SUH screening scores. Now it's time to gather the data. So in this step, you want to be consistent and follow other data management best practices, such as data organization and documentation. You may want to document any data inconsistencies you encounter, check the data sets for any duplicates or errors, and then use validation tools, uh, such as those in Excel or other softwares like maybe Azara as well, when possible. Once you've completed gathering the data, this is where you'll actually begin the data analysis phase. So you'll compile, validate, and clean the data that you have gathered. You'll work to conduct descriptive analysis and observe the trends. So if you are on platforms such as Azara, I believe they have features that can help streamline this analysis. You may wanna calculate a correlation analysis as well, and then create a graph to help visualize the trend that will be shared among staff and leadership when interpreting the data. So here in our example, you can see that we were able to hypothetically uh, look at our data and gather information relating to S2H scores in individuals who are diagnosed with hypertension. In step five, we are looking to really interpret the results. So when interpreting the findings, you may wanna consider if the data answers your original question, if the data helps you defend against any objections, and if there are any limitations that you have not yet considered. In our example, we can visually see that the percentage of patients who have been diagnosed with hypertension have a higher positive correlation with the number of SUH needs. And so let's also assume that with our hypothetical example, we were also able to identify transportation as the greatest SUH need within this population of focus. When you're interpreting the results with staff and leadership, you may also want to consider the following discussion questions. What initial questions do you have based on the current data presented? What observations across communities are you observing? Which of them are surprising? What are the key takeaways that you are learning from these snapshots? And are there any other data uh, runs that would be helpful? And are you doing any of them already? And in our final step, you'll want to spend time evaluating the data outcomes and determining the next steps. Decide if the original prepared data goal was achieved. You wanna maybe determine if the planning was effective, what were the lessons learned, and decide as a team the next step. So in our example, let's say that our lessons learned were that uh, we noted broader patient level data will yield stronger results and we may want to also include more queries in our next data analysis. In our next step, we plan to conduct the same assessment with additional patient level data to triangulate analysis with other conditions. So in this example, it could be diabetes. And then we may also wanna look at mitigating factors of enabling services to provide contact. So now you've completed your data analysis, it's now time to identify and prioritize actions based on those findings. Before rushing and acting on the data, you want to huddle with your team and create an action plan. And you can do this by identifying options for actions based on those findings, evaluate or reevaluate potential community partners with similar goals, consider the feasibility and sustainability of those options and partnerships, and it's also okay to select a mix of strategies based on the feasibility and best possible outcomes. So in our example with hypertension, we can 
did that we consider that we decided to share the data and partner with health plans to invest in community health workers who can help patients reduce SDOH related barriers. And as we noted that transportation was identified as an issue for this uh, population of focus, we've decided as an action to attend or host community meetings to meet with transportation agencies, share data with state transportation agency and negotiate bulk discounts on uh, travel vouchers, and also work to improve bus routes for patients in identified zip codes. So now you have your action plan in place. Now it's time to act on your identified actions. You wanna make sure you conduct a risk analysis for the actions to anticipate potential problems and to establish any type of contingency plans. You wanna assign roles and accountability for implementation and ensure actions are effectively resourced and implemented. So building off our example, we have uh, executive staff planning to share six months of data with the state transportation agency to negotiate discount rate for transportation vouchers by next month. And um, potentially maybe a contingency plan could be having the CMO attend community meetings to meet with transportation related agencies to establish or strengthen relationships to discuss and discuss mutual goals. And as you're interpreting your findings, identifying actions and acting on the data, you want to also evaluate the outcomes. So here you wanna consider the question, these following questions. Are the original desire to prepare goals being achieved? Was your planning effective? What are your lessons learned? What are your best practices that you may wanna share uh, with others within your organization or with other community health centers? Is your data strategy advancing health equity in your health center? And do you need to conduct additional uh, PDSAs maybe? And then really thinking, what are your next steps? Are you gonna to continue to build off of this? Um, so lastly, to wrap up our example uh, with our hypertension um, example, there have been successful negoti uh, negotiations for a better rate with health plans for providing better care outcomes for patients with SUH bar barriers who have hypertension. The team was also successful at negotiating bulk discount transportation vouchers. And the lessons learned in next steps include educating staff and community, uh, uh, educating staff about community partner resources for addressing SDOH. As they noted throughout this example, that not all staff were aware of that. So that wraps up our high level presentation. And I know Eureka and I have several discussion questions in mind, but before we dive into those, are there any questions for us or reflections based off the information that was shared? And you feel free to raise your hand, come off mute. Um, Eureka, I, I can't find the chat, so. <laughs> That's okay, I have it open. <laughs> so thanks Lisa for your, um, for your question, she asked, wouldn't you want to track this over time to confirm that this is an issue that is ongoing and not just the signal in the data? Um, when, when it is a trend that you would want to associate, that you would want to associate in intervention funding and resources? Absolutely. I think over time is, is always a really helpful, it's always good to see how things happen over time um, and definitely would recommend that um, because I, I know there's also seasonal things that happen, right? At As you all provide care for health centers, we know, um, for example, like back to school season, flu season, all those things that happen, right? So you wanna be able to understand kind of what's happening and understand the context, uh, but also like you said, just kind of make sure that some of the things that you're seeing in your data, it's not just a blip, if you will, so. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if, if, if Nilani wanted to add anything to that. No, those were uh, really great points, Eureka. Couldn't say it better. <laughs> so if there are no other questions, Eureka, should we go ahead and dive into our discussion question? I think so. That would be fun. <laughs> so I'll go ahead and kick us off. So I know there are several of of you folks who answered the poll saying that you are collecting um, SUH data and have a data analysis kind of in place. Um, so 
do you mind sharing what has been working well for you in your health center's data strategy? And what are your barriers that you're encountering? And feel, feel free to come off mute or drop it in the chat. Um, but I think as we all, we as health centers, um, all right, Dominic, I see your hand is up. <laughs> Let's see. Hi, uh, my name is Dominic. I'm with Central Med. I'm one of the data analysts on the team. Um, so pretty much in terms of our, of our data collection, we have two like levels of it. So first we have a preliminary screening that's done by the MAs and the clinics. And pretty much they just screen the patients. Uh, they, there's a list of 10 needs, like housing, transportation, food, and so on and so forth. And patients check mark that off. And then from there, the provider sends us a referral over to mm -hmm. our department where we have intake coordinators that uh, do an intake assessment and then our case managers who actually do the prepare assessment. And so in terms of data collection, it's, a, I'd say on terms of the side of going from the provider to us, it's a little bit messy because currently they only use like one Z code, I believe. Mm. But the good thing is, is that uh, with our prepare assessment, we have it integrated into the EHR. So it drops Z codes for us once we complete the prepare assessment. Music so we definitely, <laughs> we definitely have a lot of information to work with. I guess it's a matter of just organizing it and actually integrating it with also the actual health data right now for us. Thanks, Dominic. Appreciate you. All right. Um, Anu has here in the chat, um, regarding negotiations to help with resources and vouchers, is the negotiation with the payers insurance plans only? I think... Um, I, I would hope to say that they're not the only ones that you can have a conversation with. Obviously, they're, it's probably a little bit easier because um, they're the ones that are providing uh, payment for, for care of, and treatment of your patients. So I think that's always a good starting point. Um, yeah, so I think that that's definitely helpful. Nalani, is there anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I don't think it's just limited to payers and insurance plans. I think that's where you can start, but you can think of other maybe community-based organizations or other companies like I know Lyft and Uber are actually doing some really great work in this space with transportation vouchers or maybe a local taxi company. It's really, I think sometimes not just looking at the payers or insurance plans, but really diving into your community and seeing what are those partnerships or organizations that you guys could come together to work on a mutual goal. Great. Thanks, Nalani. Um, so we have here from Sanja Knight in the chat. I feel like we're still learning how to collect the data in a useful way and figure out how we want to use it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think that's got common reflection and observation from a lot of folks in the field. Um, and I think that's where that um, interdisciplinary conversation with you know, IT, quality staff, um, leaders, all, all like having that, everyone at the table to have this discussion can be really helpful because, um, you know, there might be some barriers in the data collection process, right? And, and maybe that's something that others at the, at the health center need to hear so that there's um, some creativity in terms of problem solving, but also identifying resources. So thanks for that. Um, Heidi dropped in the chat. Can you clarify which Z code you referenced? Dominic, if you can respond to that in the in the chat or just come off mute, that'd be great in terms of which Z code uh, your folks use. And I will say in regards to Z codes, with the prepared tool, we have mapped the questions to Z code, codes, Loink and SNOMED. And so we do have that crosswalk that is available. Um, maybe we can see if uh, one of us can go ahead and put it in the chat. If not, we'll make sure to send it out um, just so you have that as a, a reference. Thanks, Nalani. Dominic, did you wanna just provide some, some detail in terms of which, oh, thank you. Um, okay. Which Z code do they send, do you know? If you can respond in the chat, that'd be great. Um, and then here we have from Anu, um, even with collecting all the information regarding SUH, how can the needs be addressed since providers and staff may not always have the time to address with the time that's available with the patient? And that's a great observation. I think that's something that 
should be discussed as a health center, as a full team, because expect the provider or just one person to address those needs only within the time of the visit is really unrealistic, right? We know people are probably trying to go back to work, trying to pick up kids or, or older adults or whoever. Um, so really thinking more broadly in terms of if, if we're going to collect this data and we need to respond it, if we can't do it within the time of the visit, what's the contingency plan? What's the follow-up? Maybe there's a health a community health worker or someone that can help with addressing that. Um, but we also understand too that there may be limited resources um, or maybe you're in an area where there's just not that much um, resources, right? So it could be resources in terms of the area, but also staffing, right? Um, so even if you don't, if even if there a resource or referral cannot be provided, you know, it's it's difficult to see, and I do want to acknowledge that it's really hard for all of us to see a need in our patients and not be able to do anything about it. But if we at least can keep that in the mind, in our minds as we provide care, um, we understand the barriers of our patients. We understand that they're, you know, they're not having transportation or they're they're being hungry is going to be a really big barrier in their care. That's okay. Again, it's hard to unsee that and unhear that and to feel like you can't do nothing about it. But, um, you know, we understand that there's a lot of limitations in a lot of our communities and we can't just, we don't have a genie that we can tap into to just build housing or provide more food. So we have to navigate that, that difficulty, right? Um, but yeah, I think it's something that could always you could always have a conversation with your team, see what is available, and then, and maybe even at a larger discussion, you know, it could it could be something statewide that could be a resource. So that's where partnering with your PCAs, your primary care associations could be really powerful because then they can advocate for some resources for the state or the region. So I definitely encourage you all to um, to do that. I'm obviously it's going to be challenging with the staff turnover, but that's something that could be done. Um, let's see here. I'm just in the chat. Um, while you're looking at the chat, you're going to also add here specifically when you know that, you know, providers and staff may not have the time or the bandwidth. I think it's really great to take a look at your workflow and see where that value added time is. See what information from the prepared tool you're already collecting. Cause maybe those aren't the, if you're already collecting that at, you know, the front desk, then those questions don't need to be asked again or maybe you have access to tablets or the PDF version that folks can fill out while in the waiting room or really finding that sweet spot and sense in your current workflow. So that way it doesn't become this additional data burden task or just another thing to do. And so that will take having the team come together, all the staff from the front desk to the clinical provider, the uh, case manager to sit down and say, look at our workflow, what information are we collecting and where can we fold in um, those other questions as appropriate? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Melody. Um, and then I see, I'm seeing here, there's, thank you, Dominic, for just providing additional context in terms of, um, you know, information around Z codes and how that all works together. Um, I see Anu that you dropped in. Since we're able to submit the, uh, the SDOH diagnoses to claims, wouldn't it be useful to partner with the plans who actually have access and means to correspond with the patient? Absolutely, right? I think that's something that's worthwhile. Um, I remember when I worked at a health center, we actually worked with AmeriHealth Caritas, um, and they supported us on doing, uh, on doing home visits, um, community health workers to do home visits with our patients just you know, obviously it was outside the clinic visit, but to be able to go to the patient's home to work with them, um, that really was a great way to, to leverage um, the resources from the payer, from AmeriHealth Caritas. And then from there, I mean, I left the health center afterwards, but, you know, it starts that conversation. So I think, you know, it's always payers understand that there's a need to, um, that they that more than just medicine or clinical treatment is going to be needed to improve the health of our community. So that's a great, that's a great idea, Anu, and I definitely encourage you all to consider that. Um, definitely start there. As Nalani said, it's a great starting point. It's not the only point, but that's definitely a great starting point. Um, and as you continue to make that, as you continue to partner with payers, there now you're starting to get that data, that evidence base, if you will, so you can get more investments in meeting the needs of your, of your community. 
Um, let's see here. All right. Um, and then we have here from Lisa, creating a hierarchy of needs to prioritize is a best practice that care management uses at the payers. Absolutely. And obviously, I, I you know just want to reflect that this is a great this is a great approach because even with our patients they will have a lot of needs, but you can't meet all of them at once. So just trying to understand which is the most pressing need. Obviously, I think the, the ones that come to mind and most payers seem to be gravita gravitating towards uh, housing, food, transportation, and safety. Um, but obviously everything else within PREPARE is still really relevant because they're all interconnected. Um, but we do know that there's a hierarchy in terms of most pressing need at the moment. So thank you for sharing that, Lisa. Um, and then Dominic shared that they have over 17 modifications to the workflow. Goes to show you how long it, it takes and, and you know how many times you just really have to refine the process and maybe it's per population or, or screening consideration, if you will. Lindsay asked how often they screen their patients for SDOH. Sandra kindly responded in the chat that they try to screen their patients every six months with the hope of at least capturing, catching more of their patients at least once a year. That's what we've heard from a lot of folks, at least annually, um, but some of these may change, right? So I think, especially as our economy changes and things, a lot of dynamics are happening outside the walls of the health center, we may need to ask more frequently about food insecurity or housing, right? So you'll have a sense, and I have heard from some health centers where um, they'll kind of if they've done a previous prepare screening, they'll kind of uh, say, well, we've worked on this, these items together, together, how have the resources been? What concerns do you have? And again, if you keep it as a, as a conversation, um, and sometimes we've heard from some health centers that they, they ask if anything's changed since their last visit, um, that's like a, a, like a big overarching way to do that. But, you know, that's, that's just one consideration there. Um, there's no magic bullet answer, <laughs> but we're hearing a lot from the field that at least annually. And for some of these questions, you may not even need to ask them again, but that's just some, some highlights from, from what we've heard from the field. Um, and then Dominic I, I put in the chat, we do a mini screening every visit. Absolutely. Patients are always able to decline the mini assessment as the assessment becomes more common in the clinic work below. That's a great idea. And thank you for sharing that, Dominic. Um, yeah. And I think a lot of people are trying to just get a sense of what, what fits best for their health center, but also their patient population. And sometimes depending on our patient population, we may have to ask more questions um, more frequently or just a couple questions. Um, let's see here. And then Tara mentioned in the chat that they screen annually and they review Azara. And if they indicate in the past they were homeless or had a food insecurity, we'll screen them again at their next appointment. Thank you. And then I believe Dominic dropped in the chat uh, a screenshot of something that they do. Um, so thank you for sharing that, uh, Dominic. That's really helpful. Thank you for sharing that. So and yeah, that's like a great way to just kind of keep it high level. So um, so we've had a lot of great conversation and discussion in the chat. Um, thank you for sharing that example of the mini screening, Dominic. That's really helpful. Um, I just want to go back to a question that Nalani had asked previously in terms of um, what are some of the barriers that you are all, that you are all experiencing when it comes to creating an effective data strategy as well as, or even possibly analyzing your data? What, what are some things that come to mind in terms of um, challenges, concerns, barriers, and actually being able to do that? Um, and it's okay if you can't answer that, but just wanted to circle back to that because that's something that we would really be interested in hearing about just to understand how we can best support all of you. So there are no barriers. Let me stop. <laughs> I'm joking. Terrible joke. Um, but yeah, if you, if you have any barriers, we'd love to learn more about those barriers. So definitely feel free to drop it in the chat. Um, Nalani, I'm not sure if there are any other questions you wanted to. I know we had a couple questions that we have. Yeah, but... Another question that we drafted up was um, for the folks who are um, collecting that data, are you working 
or folks who have a data strategy, have you worked with your PCA or HTCN and are you sharing the data with them? All right, so Heidi did mention a barrier that's <laughs> related to yeah. Epic. So they have been I told think. that there is a barrier to getting prepared mm -hmm. into Epic. So can we yeah. speak to this? <laughs> You sure can. Um, so we've been in multiple conversations with Epic and Epic at this time has chosen not to move forward with um, activating a license agreement in order to build out prepare onto their platform. Um, so if you are on Epic and want prepare access and please continue to put in that request to Epic representatives, because I think if they hear from their clients themselves, they're more likely to be open to coming back to the table. I know they are in the process of building out the CMS AHC tool, which here we go. Can you remind what that stands for by any chance? It's like the... Well, it's Accountable health community. Yes, maybe. accountable health um, community. Yes. Okay. And so they are in the process of building that out, which does include three of the prepare questions, but it's not the full prepare tool. Um, so in order for them to build out that tool, they do need to, they have been at the table with us just to get agreement in place since three of those questions do belong to the prepare assessment. But ultimately, as this right now, the reason why Epic doesn't have prepare on their platforms because they do they have chosen not to move forward with a license agreement. And just to answer Anu, um, we do know that we do know that Epic has the SDOH wheel. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so I think that's that's their investment that they've made into that. Um, but yeah. And I think I see here from Megan, we're continuing to advocate for prepare to be built into Epic. But in the meantime, we have built the SUH into a questionnaire that goes through my chart to patients once a year. And then the results come back in an in-basket that our float nurse watches and sends out to the provider before the patient visits. Yeah, there's like that requires a lot of um, resource. Right. And hopefully <laughs> I prepare, prepare over the wheel. <laughs> Thank you. <Yes>. I <laughs> Oh yeah, I know. I've heard from folks that use the wheel, they hate the wheel. And I've seen the wheel. <laughs> I'll say that. And I'm just like, oh, this isn't the best. Yeah, it does. It pulls from many different areas of an epic. Yeah. So thank you for that. We'll have to like convene all the prepare users that are on Epic together to see what sort of advocacy efforts we can do. Yeah. And it's not like, yeah, it's it's considering all the epic is doing, I mean, the license agreement would be a drop in the bucket, but yeah, the, the, the wheel sounds so ominous. It kind of is, yeah. All right, so we're down to the last four minutes or so. Any other, what other comments or concerns or questions or ideas would you all like to share with us while we're still together virtually? I was just gonna throw in a comment that, oh, in our health center, we have behavioral health workers that um, that do a similar job to the CHWs on the primary care side. And uh, we're in two completely different EHRs. So even though these needs are getting addressed or screened for these patients, um, it, it makes some of the data collection a little bit harder because it's being collected or it's being noted in two different systems. I know that they're working towards finding a, an EHR that works for both, but creates a lot of coordination of care too. Thanks, Sandra. And I think Lisa kind of has a similar question in the chat in terms of, um, you know, and, and to the best of her knowledge, she's sensing that there's double screening going on as well as multiple referrals. So I think it's it's really a matter of even, even backing up even more and seeing where patients get screened and what questions are asked. And obviously that's a lot, um, you know, doing that 
that crosswalking of, of data collection that occurs in the health center and just seeing where that information is pulled and like where it's mapped to as well. Um, yeah, I think that's a big challenge. Um, so thank you for raising that. It's it's a shame because it's like there's limitations with some of the EMR. So then you invest in another tool to maybe be able to do some other things with that, but it's it's going to create a lot of inconsistency with that. So um, we'll have to really definitely, I would say we'll have to dig more into that as we, um, you know, as our team has really been working on prepare, just trying to see what else can be done to improve how these systems talk to each other. Obviously, it's going to take really working with the health centers, um, but yeah. Um, oh, thanks for providing that answer, Dominic. Um, in terms of, we're seeing, obviously, like there's one question that we've gotten a lot over the last couple of years that we're hoping to crack and trying to figure out is terms of, you know, a family type screening for, for patients, obviously with our pediatric patients, but um, we'll be sure to report out once we get more information on that. Um, Dominic asks, has there been any predictive modeling with SUH data to predict patient outcomes using machine learning? Not to our knowledge, I think that's a great question. I think a lot of, I think from what I've, from what I understand, there's some hesitancy with doing that because some of the data as it exists isn't, um, needs some cleaning and validation. So wouldn't want to do that. And then it causes harm to our patients. So I think that's something that I know our clinical informatics team at NAC really wants to do. Um, I see two more questions here. We're right at three. So we'll go ahead and get to them quickly. Um, what are your thoughts on sharing SUH data with your PCA or ACCN to utilize a larger data set? Absolutely. We actually really advocate for that. And I think that helps your PCA and ACCN understand your data needs as a health center, what your capacity is, but also really understanding what's happening at your community. And then you're able to then use that data on a larger scale to see what is the best strategy for the state as a whole. I know the Missouri PCA has done a lot with SDOH data and they've been able to, to do a lot of investments in terms of um, uh, in SDOH efforts at the state. So I would definitely recommend that you all have those conversations with your PCAs and your HCCN so that um, you get some support, they get some more insights and you're able to really then leverage your efforts and work together. And then finally, our last question here is, is there any data on how patients responded to the referrals and benefited from these resources? Huh, I know there is some, I think that depends on which platform you use. Um, Nalani, I'm not sure if you have any specific um, response to this one, but I know that I think that's where we keep trying to understand what's happening with documenting and then responding so that we start threading the needle through the cheese, the Swiss cheese, if you will, right? Like there's different layers to meeting the needs of our patients. And we're, we're trying to figure out how all these layers align and how they, they're threaded together. Um, but that's a great question. I know I think, I think that's something that we'll definitely take a look into that to see what, what we can find out there. So Dominic added, in San Antonio, there is a Alamo area community network where it promotes communication between organizations to show that closed loop referral process. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it always depends on the on the on the EMR and the vendor that is used for um, referrals. Um, I know there tends to be a need for refining it and making sure that it works well together. But once it's refined, you know, it it can be very powerful. I know San Diego is another area that has a very robust um, closed loop referral process down there, over there. Um, and then we also know that there are some health information exchanges as well as community information exchanges that they're able to house that information and really get a sense of how that looks. Um, but that that varies from region and state to state. So. Um, but we'll be sure to get a little bit more information on that. I know I think that's a really great question. So it's 3.02. Um, we are a little over time and we thank you all for staying on with us. Um, Nalani, I'm not sure if there's any closing comments you'd like to share. No, I want to thank everyone for joining today's session. And I'll hand things over to Chloe to wrap us up on when the next session is. Thank you, Eureka. Thank you, Nalani, for a great session.
So everyone, um, I will be emailing you all in terms of a reminder about the next session coming up. The next session coming up will be an EHR session and it will be featuring eClinical Works. And that's for users who are using such platform and that is scheduled for May 15th. And I see a question regarding recording. Yes, so the session was actually recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channel. Other than that, um, I would like to thank you all for joining. And I'm going to go ahead and drop the link for the next session here so that way you may register for it. And okay, the link is now in the chat. Please feel free to register for our next session. Other than that, thank you everyone for joining us today and have a wonderful day.